Okay, Karen, I've been looking forward to this one for a very long time. I know. Right? I talk all the time about how I live on heaven on earth because somehow I was able to bamboozle you into marrying me. And the <laughs> fact that you're still with me today after all these years and everything we've been through, there's just no other words that would fit the bill when it comes to describing all of my life with you, but heaven on earth, right? Oh, that's very sweet. No, that's true. That's reality. But now what if everyone on this planet could experience heaven without needing to marry you. Well, I was getting excited about the thought of polygamy for a minute there, but <laughs> <laughs> but that would be just a lot of work. So. Well, yeah. Well, then <laughs> what if anyone could visit the heaven, Oh, spend as much time there as they wanted, speak to whomever they wanted while there, and come back without any of the petty near-death experience side effects? Oh, well, that would be nice. I'm telling you, prepare yourself because this show promises to be nothing short of heavenly. Welcome to the Skeptic Metaphysicians. <laughs> My name is Will. And I'm Karen. And unlike Mulder and Scully, we both want to believe. So we've embarked on a journey of discovery. We've talked to people deeply entrenched in the spiritual and metaphysical world. We've thrown ourselves into weird and wonderful experiences. I even joined a coven of witches. And wait, you joined a coven? Yep, all in the interest of finding something, anything, that will prove that there's something beyond this physical, three-dimensional world we all live in. This is The, the Skeptic, Skeptic Metaphysicians. Metaphysicians. Hey there, I'm Will. And I'm Karen. And today we're off to heaven. Our guest is a past board member of the Newton Institute, whose mission is to uncover the mysteries of the afterlife. Now, with the help of more than 250 trained facilitators scattered across 48 countries, they've actually discovered what happens to a person at death, where they go, and what they do while they are there waiting to reincarnate. We know this process to be called life between lives, of course, and with over 70,000 successful sessions, they have, in a sense, mapped out the afterlife or heaven. Wow. Yes. He's the author of Three Hours and th 33 Minutes in Heaven, based on his own experiences with the afterlife. And he's here today to walk us through the astounding modality. Regan Forston, welcome to the Skeptic of Positions. How are you? Oh, thanks. Thanks. I love that we can talk about this in a fun way because some people get too serious about it. But yeah. back in the 90s, Michael Newton, who was a hypnotherapist, he was a regular hypnotherapist. He was not particularly a spiritual guy, didn't have a particular religion he followed. He said he was more agnostic than atheist or any, but he just didn't know, you know, it's really agnostic. So they just, well, I don't know. And he was helping a person, I forget now if it was to stop smoking or lose weight, you know, one of the things hypnotherapists do. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the session, we count people up so that they come back, you know, fully aware, not so they're not walking around like a zombie, you know, the rest of the day. So he starts like me to in count, the mornings. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> so he starts to count the client up and the client refuses and says, no. I don't want to come out of hypnosis. And he says, well, come on, you know, I'm going to count to one to five and you'll be on. He says, no. He said, why? And the person says, I want to go home, see my friends. And Michael's thinking, well, okay, I'm going to wake you up out of trance and you're going to be fine. You'll go home, see your friends. He says, no, I want to see my friends. All of a sudden, the client is like, whoa, there's so-and-so. And he's talking to somebody as if he's seeing somebody in his inner vision or something. And come to fully doubt what he had done is he had gone back to heaven or back home where we all come from. And he was having a, a reunion with some of his friends that were had already passed on or passed away. Finally, the session ended and Michael couldn't get that out of his mind. He said, what the heck is this? I mean, this is just bizarre. But Michael, being the kind of person he was, he was just so curious. And so everything, he proceeded to figure this out with 7,000 different clients. He would get them this transit. He would just suggest to them that they would go home. Well, the process was hit and miss for a while. They finally started fine tuning it. And in, even to this day, we're fine tuning the process to make it more successful. Where, you know, the percentage right now is about 90% of people that want to have the session, want to visit the afterlife for a few hours, can do it. Uh, I, hang I, on. I got I, I to gotta interrupt you for a second. You just dropped a bombshell there. And I want to make sure yeah. people understand what you're saying. You're saying that on the very first session, if someone goes to one of these, you or one of the other 250 practitioners of this modality, yeah, you have a 90% chance of reaching heaven. 90, nine zero. That's, yeah. okay, let me, I'll, I'll qualify that. I would say within one or two sessions, about okay, 80%, <laughs> about, uh, my client's about 80% successful in the first try. 
Wow. wow. The other ones I do, what I do is I don't charge for a second session because that way re- people can relax. You know, I say, look, mm-hmm. if you need a second session, I'll do it for you for free within a few months, you know, let things settle. When they come back, about 90% of them are successful. Then I had one woman recently, the first session, nothing much happened. Second session, she was able to go to a past life. And I'll explain the past life deal in a second to you, why we use that as a way to get to where we're going. Okay. Second session, she experienced a past life, which was she was like the cave woman. I mean, walking around with, with a bag of stuff and her husband was hunting and they end up getting lost or something. She died in the snow, you know, somewhere after that. She says, well, wow. That, I says, if I'm making up a past life, I'm not going to be some woman in a fur thing following a guy in the <laughs> snow so he can hunt, you know. <laughs> Uh, it's just like she, I'm going to be a princess. And thus, be a and princess thus feminism was born, like this, you know, <laughs> or, yeah. or, or something. And so that intrigued her enough. So she came back for a third session. She was able to visit another past life, and all of a sudden, she sees herself pass away. She turns around, and there's like a guy there. But then she's in what we call the black. It's like it, I think we think it's a real place because some people end up being there and they just feel they're somewhere, but they don't see anything. All they do is feel good. You know, like, wow, I'm in this neat place, but there's, I'm not seeing anything in my inner vision or anything. We have a way now that we've learned around that. Is we just take our time a little bit, let them float around in the black. And eventually, like happened with me, because it took me two times. First session, I got all freaked out, kind of like, what's going on? And I, I couldn't settle down. I got my, mm-hmm. my left brain, my analytical brain too much in it. So we had to stop the session. But three or four days later, they worked with me. We did it, and I went to the past life, which was pretty cool. And then, and then I'm in this black, and I'm not seeing anything. Well, the facilitator knew to just take his time with me. And about ten minutes later, so I'm just flowing this black. I saw a pinpoint of like red, like a dot of red. And and he said, "Well, just kind of float over towards it." And in a microsecond, there was I was out of there. I, there was my guide, and I had the most incredible experience of my life so far. That in my book, I just had to write it down because it was just. So interesting that me, Regan, this, even at hypnotherapy school, I, when I went for two years, I was the last guy in the class to be hypnotized. You know, I kept volunteering every time, pick me, pick me. And I'd go up there <laughs> yeah. and I'd walk out going, this is nothing, you know, yeah. I'm not so, hypnotized from, or from, anything. From firsthand experience, Regan, I'm telling you, it's because apparently we want it too much. Uh, yeah. That's the one thing. If, you, if you're pushing and trying, it's harder to happen. You just right. have to relax because the process that we found works is that we just take people through the natural process of falling asleep. That's paying attention to the breath and every breath, breathing in. And when you breathe out and you get to the very bottom of the breath, before you breathe in again, there's a real quiet space. It's like nothing's moving in your body. You're not using, no muscles are moving or anything. And it, it's kind of like you kind of ratchet down each breath you take and you're falling asleep, you get down to the bottom. You go a little deeper and then you breathe in, you down the bottom. It's not like a light switch. You know, people will and you're just out, you know, like that. It's a process of falling asleep. Okay. So what we do, because we're communicating with the person, right? It uh, is they're just about to fall asleep. We're communicating with them. So we kind of keep them in that relaxed state. It's right on the verge of falling asleep. It seems that, that this is a natural thing. Like if people had the ability on their own to just relax, but to keep themselves just before falling asleep that way. I call it a God switch, but it, it seems that um, at that point, people easily access memories of past lives. Maybe they've been in heaven a thousand times before. Mm. In our research, we found out that's our true home. You know, mm. it, it changes the paradigm a little bit when you realize you're not created in the womb, but you, God created you on the other side and you're just down here visiting, Okay. That right, even makes right. more sense as you think about it, that God creates us. And then we decide to have experience and learn and grow to be more loving, like a play that we want to be in, where you can play a certain character, where you can learn a certain thing that mm-hmm. you wouldn't otherwise. It's easy for people to understand if I say that you know, we're down here and we're to play. And during our play, in different scenes, different people show up. Sometimes nice, sometimes our antagonist shows up and we have these huge learning experiences, you know, that we have mm-hmm. to deal with, we have to deal with the difficult things in life. So. You picture this, you're sitting in a movie theater and you're watching your play. So what I do to help people prepare for a session is send them homework. And in the homework, what they do is uh, they write a list of the cast of characters in their play. You know, they write just a few sentences about them. So we know 
who the players are. And then they write a list of questions that they want to have answered about their current life. Some of the questions are general. We ask like, why did this person decide to be born? What what was their purpose? Could we all have meaning and purpose? Uh, What's the mission? What do we hope to learn? What do we hope to help others? Okay, we ask all those questions. But people have other questions. So many of the people that are doing these sessions are over 50, 60. You know, you a lot of people in their 60s, 70s, 80s. Mm-hmm. And they're at a point in their life where they're going, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? I, I'm retired, blah, 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 blah. And then they want to find out what's their mission now that they have time to do things. You know, what can they do to make the world a better place and everything? So everybody has their own thing. And then and the list of people, generally people have a handful of people that have died that they want to talk to when they get to the other side. That's what we call a soul group. We put terms on everything because it's easier to explain this process. So generally what happens is when people get to that deep state of relaxation, in order to access the other side, we ask their soul or their higher self to take them to a past life that has some sort of relevance to their current life, because there usually seems to be one you'd want to pay attention to because We generally bring in some unfinished business into Mm -hmm. our current life that we're still working on something. We don't spend a lot of time in a past life because it's just a doorway to kind of get to the afterlife. Some people just come to me, they want to do a past life regression session, and we'll do that and we'll spend a lot of time there. and We'll try to get as much information as we can because some people want to kind of check that out and see if they can find a person of that name or things that they can remember if they could kind of prove a past life, you know, kind of thing. But we just... We usually just have to do two or three scenes from a person's memory of a past life that we have them go to the death scene. And I would say most of the time they're in a bed somewhere in a house, there's somebody there with them. Oh. Occasionally I've had people getting hung or been in battles and getting killed. We even had one that was, um, was only alive for a few hours and it was just oh, uh, wow. like a, like a crib death in that lifetime. Um, you know, people wonder about crib death. What was your purpose for that? My clients who's in trance at time says, well, I was going to come down, only be there for very just a few hours or a few short time because my mom needed to have the experience of having a baby that passed away then because of stuff she would learn from that. Okay. Mm, uh, it also, it was karmic a little bit. There was, by doing that, there was some kind of karma that that soul, you know, got rid of, you know, there's a book. Okay. Two books that are so great uh, um, that Michael Newton wrote, they just sold over a million copies. One is called Journey of Souls. That's his first book. He did that in 1995. And about 10 years later, because so many people wrote him and said, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? And he was continuing research all the time. So the second book's a little thicker. It's called Destiny of Souls. And in there, there's a lot more specifics, you know, about things that he found out, you know, about the afterlife and things like that. Right. So those are two, those are two great books for people that are listening to this podcast. They want to Right, right. Oh, that that awesome. So, I, I like how you said you talked about the dreams and how they can insert themselves into dreams to kind of make people feel better because I know that happened to me when my grandmother passed away. Yeah. yeah. And it was interesting because the dream that I had was I was, she lived with my father at the time. And so my father and his wife were sitting at a table and I was sitting there or I was kind of observing. I don't even know if I was part of the dream, but I'm, I'm watching this dream happen. And my grandmother comes and she sits down between them and they couldn't see her at all. But she looked directly at me and just smiled and nodded her head. Oh, wow. Mm, as she would do, yeah. Yep. yep. Uh, so I just, just want to point out, we are halfway through this interview, and I don't think we've asked oh, wow. you a single question. So <laughs> wow. this is actually the easiest There's interview so we've ever done. We just <laughs> teed it up and let Regan take it. <laughs> yeah. Now, I mean, we do have to take, we do have to take, okay, a, take break. a break. So okay. uh, be- before we continue the conversation, we've gone through the past life and the death experience. From there, it opens up the gateway into the afterlife. When we come yes, back, perfect. we're going to dive into the afterlife with vegan force and stay with us we'll be right back right. welcome back to the skeptic metaphysicians we are talking to regan forsen who is taking us to heaven right i'm so excited yeah. because he's like a heavenly tour guy he's, he's, oh my god why did i not think about that in fact <laughs> i think we found our episode title yeah. regan the heavenly tour guide okay before the break we talked about how you use past life regression as, as a gateway to get you into uh, the afterlife it makes perfect sense yeah. you go to the the end time and then where do we go from there beyond that instead of coming back or going to another life we now follow them right I, i'm assuming that's yeah. exactly what you do yeah you you go back home spend some time there and plan your next journey you know in, in the research we've done now uh, some souls choose not to come back 
And not everybody that God creates has incarnations in force. So souls that have been created are all the time behind the scenes. You know, they're behind the scenes. But it seems like every soul has, they're doing work. And it, it seems like there's a progression. Like when there's, when a, for a lot of people, once you become God realized in a sense where you're, I say your love quotient is really, really great and you pass on. And a lot of times you'll take jobs as being on a council. It's kind of like if you're in the sixth grade and there's people in the fifth grade, there's things you know that they don't know yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. But if you're really, really loving and that person down there you see needs to need something, you kind of reach down and kind of help them out. But then you look above yourself and there's someone in seventh grade that's reaching down to you to kind of help you go on. You know, mm. so there's that kind of camaraderie or that love. There's no, we've not found anything of a negative nature at all in this process that people have. No one's experienced like evil demons or anything like that. It's just, if you experience it, you just, you feel in a sense like as you're having it, it's just like buckets of love just poured over you, you know, and mm. that's, it's just, that's the best way I can explain it. It's, it's otherworldly well, in a sense. Me Maybe that should be the episode title. Bucket of Love. Bucket of love. Like love. I, do. I love that. I, I love that. Yeah. So I so, have a question for you. We, yeah. We've spoken with a bunch of different people that have had near-death experiences, and, and sometimes the things they say are similar, and sometimes they're different. In your experience, is heaven the same for everyone? Um, 28 of us therapists, we, sw we swap sessions. The very first session that I did was from a person who was a medium from Australia. He had a TV oh. show and everything over there. And um, he wanted to go through a session. And here's why I'm learning training in my manuals like this thick. So I've got the pages as I'm going like this. <laughs> and he, I'm taken to a past life. And all of a sudden he goes, Regan. And I go, what? He says, I, I'm already in the past life. And I go, oh, okay. So I got to go with the pages. <laughs> and so far, and we, he was, he ended up being a, a, a little girl. He was a girl about eight or nine years old, was carrying two buckets of water. And, um, and I said, where do you, what the water for? She said, they're for the horses. And I forget what the little girl's name was. So I'm telling this because I'd say half the time, especially the women that I do the sessions with. And by the way, about 70% of the sessions are done are of these 70,000 cases are women and about 30% is just men. Seems like women are so much they're You know how, you know, us guys are a little brain dead. So, it's, you know, hard, <laughs> it's hard for, it's hard for us to to get vulnerable, it's hard for us to open up the heart a little bit more. Once anyway, again, Regan is calling me out personally. I, yes. I'm starting to get a little, uh, you know, get a little okay. complex here. Okay, Regan. I have to say me. I'll just say me. Uh, so, so this man who's in a past life now and is a little girl with the two buckets of water, I say, well, let's uh, let's go home and uh, and see where the horses are. And she goes, I can't, I can't. And I say, why? She says, I can't cross this road. And I said, why can't you cross this road? She says, because this wagon that's coming down the road is going to run over and kill me. So here's my first oh. session. There's this little girl in this other life. Heck, if I'm telling her to cross that road where she's going to get <laughs> oh killed. I mean, this is my first go back, session. Go back. And I'm going, I went, okay. Luckily, what happened was the higher self of my client speaks and says, she needs to go through the experience. Tell her to cross the room. Okay. It's off of me now. He's telling me to tell he, that little girl who he was in another lifetime across the road and get killed. Just, just following orders, boss. <laughs> just following orders. So all, right. all of a sudden I said, what's happening? And she says, I'm bleeding out the, the way that her father ran over this little girl. And I mm. said, okay, you know, one, two, three, you, you're, you're out of your body. And she says, no, I need to experience this. So I was quiet for a little bit. And then the little girl sent us, you know, through him says, okay, I'm finished now. And I said, well, what happened? She says, well, I, I died. And I'm above my body. And I says, are you ready to go back home now? She says, no. She says, I have to stay here with the, the man that, that drove the wagon. He said, he's beside himself because he just ran over mm. and killed a little girl. I thought, right. wow, how beautiful that is. It just shows you the love that's there right. for yeah. souls from there. Yeah. So um, but, anyway, but, there, but was, to, there was more in that session, but that would be another show. I can tell you there's all these crazy, yeah, wonderful yeah, that's sessions. But what, I wanted to reel you, reel you back in for a second because I, I, yeah. I want to go back to Karen's question because her question was, in your experience, does everyone experience the same thing when they go to heaven or is everyone's experience of heaven different? Yes. Okay. That's 20 things. We asked the same questions. And then we, when we came back, we all did our report. What we experienced, we sent it to someone else in the institute there. They put it all together, PowerPoint and everything. And 
I asked, uh, just the way last question I had, and before the council, we'll talk about the council in a minute, but I've asked questions of this then, uh, I call them late C. Late C is a Chinese, for me, my guide was, was it had six of them there, but he he's the one that always is the one I seem to talk to or that seems, of course, to um, communicate with me. I said, this place that you're allowing us to bring people to so that they can experience, have this beautiful experience of heaven, is this it? Is this heaven? Like just these, because we found about eight different places so far, which covers a whole bunch of stuff that people okay. do when they're over there. And so the guy different then. Yeah. So the guy, I says, is this it? And he goes, okay. you're going to miss me here. But he goes, he cool. goes, and you just like this, you haven't seen anything yet, you know? So uh, what he was telling but, me, I think was, this is, this is kind of like heaven 101, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's opened up for people to get a glimpse for, and the main reasons that they're getting a glimpse is they want people to realize that their life has meaning and purpose. They have a mission. They have something they wanted to learn, something they wanted to help teach other people or learn themselves. And the fact that they're never alone. All these 70,000 people, every single one of them has had a guide or someone that's kind of assigned to them that they mm -hmm. sometimes my clients will recognize them, start crying because it's so when all of a sudden they recognize, oh, there's so-and-so, someone that they love from the other side and they're getting to see them again. You know, like, a, like a, oh. a friend you haven't seen for a long time. It's like, you know, when you come back, having that experience, what they're hoping will happen is, is that people will get to work. They know what their mission is now. Most people find out that they're in the middle of their mission, that they're doing mm -hmm. it, but, but they just, it's nice to get that confirmation that you're mm -hmm. life, that you're really doing what you're supposed to be doing. Sometimes sure. they'll say you need to step it up a bit. You know, people are kind of gotten sidetracked a little bit in that and they'll say, well, I might get, you might kind of get a little bit. Get to it. Get, get to <laughs> it now. <laughs> yeah. Right. You so step lively, son. <laughs> yeah. So I think, you know, it's just like heaven and everything we're learning over there. We're just, we're learning because see, even having this session, we've somehow chosen this lifetime. You both and I, we've chosen to be here. This is where we need to concentrate mostly now because this is the class we're in right now. This is what we're studying mm -hmm. and everything, you know, but it is nice to know that we had other classes and we learned other things in other lifetimes and things that are helping us to be better people in this lifetime. So in other words, they don't want people just spending their head in the clouds all the time because, hey, you got to get to work. And that's what this does. I mean, people have written me a couple of years, even after they had a session and just said, you know what? Ever since that day, life has just been different for me. I've looked at people different. I found more joy and happiness in my life. I'm not, you know, bitching about how hard everything is and they're not playing the victim role anymore because they know that they signed up to have tough things happen to them that they had to work through. I have had some experiences over there when I have clients in this deep state of trance, which they they get into very easily and they're experiencing the other side that humor is a huge part of, uh, of heaven or this the other oh, thank side god. yay thank yeah. god because man i mean <laughs> yeah um I mean, I if, you to, can't, if you can't have a sense of humor about dying i don't know what else you what you can have a sense of humor about <laughs> well what was interesting was um, i had a client and her life is centered around lightness and love and and humor and everything and um when uh, she's in this process and she meets her guide and she's describing the guide to me and everything. And then, so usually what we do is we say, well, so we can communicate properly with this guide, uh, ask the guide if he'll give us his name so we can, you know, like us humans do, address each other by name or everything. She, and the guide says, uh, just call me Bob. <laughs> <laughs> she started, she's in, she's in trance now, of course. And because she has this super sense of humor, she starts laughing so hard. I'm sitting next to her. I took this half an hour to get her deep in trance, and she starts laughing so hard, belly laughing. <laughs> I start laughing so hard that way. And she said the guide was doing the same thing, you know. Oh, and it God, was no. a, a, an introduction later on in that session. I happened to think as a researcher, we were always thinking of new questions to ask and everything. But I asked the guide because it seemed that her theme there was lightness and love. That it was just a beautiful session we were doing. And I said, is there comedy clubs in heaven? And he goes, sure. <laughs> Instantly, she's in this club. There's these other souls that are there. There's a guy, he, she said, it reminded him of Rodney Dangerfield. This whole thing is about love and light, okay? So yeah. all of a sudden, um, awesome. I says, well, you know, she's there at this like comedy club on the other side. 
And she said, which well, looks like Rodney Dangerfield, I'm not sure if it's him, but it's kind of like him. He's making the same kind of jokes. So Rodney, whoever that was, did a joke and all of a sudden wings pink appeared on him. And the audience is laughing like crazy. She's laughing like crazy. I says, what was the joke? She says, I don't know, but everybody's laughing so hard. I'm laughing, you know. He says, I guess I guess it was like an <laughs> inside infectious. joke. You know, like you had to be uh, in heaven to kind of understand what that humor God. was. But then, I, I here's that. what was beautiful, yeah. though. I started asking more questions. I said, well, ask, a, ask your guide there, like, what's the importance of humor down here? He proceeded to do about a 10-minute through her talking. You know, she would repeat exactly what he was saying through her. It was all about the describing, like, love is like if you picture a pie, you know, different sections like they do on, on PowerPoint and everything. And humor was a huge part of love. I just remember that that visual image that she gave me from him. Every session is similar because everybody goes through basically a template or the same kind of process that they've lined up for people to experience over there. But because everybody's at a different rate of unfoldment or whatever, we're all individual, the sessions have a uniqueness to them, which is just, I mean, the hair stands up on my arm sometimes. I'm sitting next to these people right. and they're in the afterlife having these beautiful experiences. So a couple of questions. Let me first start with the obvious one. You're hypnotizing, right? You're bringing them into yeah. hypnosis to do past life regression. So first, the, the question is, when you get to a certain level, what th theta waves or I think it is or whatever yeah. whatever level that you get to, yeah, it's also at the level where they say you reach the collective unconscious. So if that's the case, and that's when you're really accessing your creative thoughts, could this, everything that we are talking about now, just be a creation, a fiction, uh, us kind of uh, creating a story for ourselves? What makes you think that specifically this is not just something we're making up, but rather we are actually crossing over and remembering things that happen between lives? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a really good question. And in the, yes. um, in the research we're doing, we're constantly wondering about that. You know, the simplest thing is, well, whether we're making it up, or whether it's real, it has a super beneficial emotional and physiological effect on your body that makes life better or easier or seems to be more understanding. So whatever it is, it's a good thing, you know, even if we're just making mm -hmm. it up. What I find, though, is, is the fact that, okay, of the different stations they go to, this would be a good time to bring in there. Almost all of my clients experience going before counsel, getting their questions answered. The councils are generally unique to each person. Some people have three or four elders or people on there. Uh, sometimes people have 20 or 30, but generally it's five or six, you know, like it's just it's like a, an intimate group. Um, and they can answer, they can get questions about their life answered and everything. Um, and then from there, we ask if they have permission to go to their soul group. And these are souls that you generally, they say they're your favorites. You know, like in, on the other side, you like here on earth, we have friends, good friends that we're really close to. Um, so groups uh, can range from uh, 10 to 20 or 30 or 40, but then there's subgroups of those. Sometimes there's people that come from other acting troops in a sense to come in and to be at our play. But here's, here's what really makes it real to me. For instance, I'll give you an example. As I had a woman come to me whose husband had hung himself and killed himself. And um, she was be totally beside herself. This man she loved for every ounce of, of everything she was, loved this man. And uh, she came home and he was hanging in the garage. Oh and gosh. she had not been able to work. She'd been going to therapists. And the therapist that knew the work that I did didn't seem to be getting anywhere with her. So he says, look, this may seem kind of weird, but here's Regan's number. And maybe he can help you contact your husband on the other side. And you can find out why he did this horrible thing. And what's going on? So she came to me not believing in this process, just desperate mm -hmm. to do something. Okay. She was one of my easiest clients. I mean, just she went, she went, got really deep there, um, went to a past life. And then we asked if the guy that we were with, he said, well, you probably know why we're here, but in case you don't, I'm, you know, I'm going to just say my client here, her husband killed herself and she's wondering if she can see him. They said, yes, but just for a short time, just for a few minutes. And so all of a sudden there he was and oh my gosh, my client is her client. She's just crying like crazy. I'm crying like crazy because I'm feeling mm. all the emotion because she goes, this is here. This is him, you know? Oh my gosh. And so she, she asked, why did you do that? 
he apologized. He says, I'm so, so sorry. She says, it had nothing to do with you. He says, there was some stuff I was dealing with from childhood, abuse and things that I never told you about, and it just overcame me. And I just, he says, when I, I hung myself in a way that I couldn't undo it, but I wished I could have undo, done it. He said, but it was just too late and I couldn't. And he said, sweetheart, she says, look, I'm so sorry. And I hope when you pass away, we're back together again. If we get to do this over again or something, because I love you, we're soulmates or whatever. We're going to just give it another try. And that, that you could see that that made her feel good. But then mm. the guide, another guy comes in and says, that's all the time you have. And then he's looking at her and he says, he says, I'm so afraid where they're taking me. It's, I said, well, ask him why, you know, because his reason is, well, where are they taking him? And he tells her, these guides are taking him to show him what his life could have been like if he hadn't killed himself. In other words, oh, he had hung in there. Lord. <laughs> now, that, so like made it, that made it real to me because that's what yeah. an answer. I mean, doesn't that seem like the most loving thing that you could be done on the other side that they... They know you goofed up that you didn't, you know, you took the easy way out because of your humanness and you blew your mission in a way, you know, mm. and they just, I, I believe they wanted to show him so that it would instill in him when you go down and try it again, you can do it next time. You know, don't, right. don't take that way out. So that's right. just, oh gosh, these, these, yeah. there's, there's so much emotion. Yeah. So that's what makes it so real is the fact that now after yeah. her having the session, she still missed him like crazy. She still had a grieving process to go through, but some heaviness lifted off of her because she realized it wasn't her fault. She got to see him and realize they're going to be together again and get an apology from him. Right. So did she make it up? Did it all under something? Well, it sure was good. You have all the answers for us no. because you, you've talked to so many different people about this. You have the answers yeah. about what, what happens in the afterlife. So I think we can have you back. 17 times and oh, still not I, get through all yes. of the information. Yeah. So, but, so I got to ask the big question because we're getting close to running out of time. Yeah, we are. And this is the question that everybody listening is begging me to ask. At least that's okay. what I like to tell myself. <laughs> In all of these sessions that you've done, what have they said or has anyone said about God? What is God? Have they met oh. God? Is there God? What is God? Okay, here's another thing that made this makes this seem so real to me. Uh, when people on the other side say, well, can I see God? Or where's God? This place or this portal has been open. People feel the presence. They call it the presence over there. They feel the presence much more than we do here. Like they're closer in some sense to that. But it's almost like God is still beyond comprehension. Even there in, in heaven, it's not like you can go up and shake his hand or something like he's a person or something. You know, like he's this loving presence that people feel that know that this presence is there. But what is this presence? You know, we could we seem to have to think of it in a bodily form, but it's 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 this consciousness or this something that's not male or female or it's just lung. You know, this consciousness. So in this part of heaven, anyway. Now, people that have been Christian that come to me, I make sure that I ask over there. Is Jesus around and can they have a conversation with him? Every single Christian that's come to me and done that has had a personal audience with Jesus. Tears are running down their eyes when they feel the love of Jesus. And the things that he tells them and stuff, it's just like you would think Jesus would be total love, acceptance, and that. But for people that are, you know, other, you know, it's like Jesus is part of people's life and he is part of this big equation and very, very important for a lot of people, but he's not everything, you know? I mean, there's like, if people ask, what's the one religion? You know, they go, God, okay, now here I am. Tell me the one religion. I'm going to start it tomorrow. You know, do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the church of will. <laughs> here so far, so, what we've got, when they ask about that, they say, if you feel you need a religion, choose one. If one speaks to you, that's going to help you in your mission. That's going to help you to be more loving. This you're going to feel like you need to have a religion, then go ahead. When we ask, what's the one practice, you know, because people say, okay, I'm here right now, but I know I'm going to go back in my body and I'm going to be like, duck the dud again, like be able to, to have this experience. And they say meditation. They say that uh, 100%. They'll say, if you want to kind of keep connected, if you want to have your intuition improve, 
so that you can hear the thoughts or the hear that what we're trying to help you with that meditation. And again, now people have meditation. I could do a whole show on that yes. sometime if you want to, because meditation is people have this vision that meditation is just one thing where you're just sitting in the lotus position for hours at a time and you're just aching and you can't stand it because you're being in one place for so long. <laughs> there are so many ways to meditate. You know, sure. there's you can meditate for two minutes a day. They just want you to make that connection where you're like, when I was coming back, one of the big things, when I was coming back, I, I felt I was above the world. I was I had this feeling I could see the earth and it just looked, oh my gosh, just, just this beautiful ball in space, just, just slowly moving around. And it just, it just, wow, what a most beautiful place. As I started getting a little closer, I started feeling physical pain. And my guy stunned me. And he says, what you're feeling, and you're feeling all the pain of the earth, all the um, emotion that people are having. Because you can imagine like at this moment right now, Ooh. if we had to, oh, uh, we would explode. We had to take a mm. million mm-hmm. of the pain going on people's emotions, right? And then he said, he said to me, are you sure you want to do this work? Which is what I'm doing, this thing mm-hmm. here. <laughs> Here's this guy right there. And I said, F yes. <laughs> so thank you for censoring yourself about, yeah right yeah. The, okay. the radio stations are saying thank you right now right but that's how deeply i could feel it like i was making mm-hmm. this choice to do this work he said okay if you want to do this work i'm going to tell you four things to do and if you don't do these four things your physical body is going to get sick and you're going to die so i said okay i'm listening oh, wow. Well, what do you want to do? Because we're dealing with energy here and good or bad, how this is, it's it's a powerful amount of energy. And when me sitting next to these people all the time and experiencing that all the time, my physical vehicle here can only deal with so much. Mm -hmm. So he said this, and this would be good for anybody. He says, when you wake up in the morning, do some sort of spiritual exercise, which means just acknowledging, you know, like I heard in my, in my mind, this is the thing is it's almost like I'm hearing things. I'm hearing a prayer in my mind as he's saying this. And what I heard was, Bless this day and those that I serve as I keep one foot in heaven and one foot planted firmly on earth to accomplish my mission of being kind at any cost. And because kindness, I found out, was one of the things that that I came down here to learn. And then the second thing he said, he said, oh, okay, now they're showing me a picture in my mind of an hourglass and I'm seeing clients. And you know how the hourglasses, of course, Mm -hmm. look. And I'm seeing clients and the sand is piling up and piling up and piling up and none, nothing's going through to the bottom. The, and he says, if the sand gets to the top, you're, you're toast. Oh. Bye-bye. So when I saw myself, when he said, do spiritual exercises, I could see myself doing that. I started seeing sand going down to the bottom. The second thing was, he said, spend more time in nature because nature is God's way. And we all know that somehow when mm-hmm. you go for a walk along the beach or you're in the woods somewhere, there's something that heals you. There's something beautiful about that. You know, we all seem to just do that naturally. You know, we know that if we go into nature, we're going to somehow heal. So I saw sand going down. The third thing was, she said, do as many random acts of kindness as you can. In my mind, I saw myself picking up a piece of trash that wasn't mine, just a little piece of trash. And someone else says, I put a thing and I could see sand going down to the bottom. And the fourth thing, he says, talk to other therapists, regular therapists that are dealing with people's problems all day. Ask them, how do they ground themselves? How do they do that? I've been pretty good, pretty good at doing most of that. Give myself mm-hmm. a, like mm-hmm. a, maybe a B minus or maybe a B, that, you know, that, that's, that way. That's I pretty good. Do a little pretty good. You know? Yeah. And, and those are great, great tips to, for anyone to, use, anyone like to, to do. do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And now you're, you're doing all these tips to keep yourself alive and I have one last question that I have to know after all of these sessions and experiences, how do you feel about your own death? Like, are you okay when it comes? Are you anxious about it? Good question, because look at me. (laughs) I'm in my mid-70s now. And when I was praying the other day, I was thinking, here's where my thoughts were. It's like, I feel like I'm just getting the hang of things here. So I say, now, don't take me yet, because I'm just, I think I could do so good here now, because I'm starting to get, I get the hang of this, and it's starting to get really fun. In life, so you I, you look really healthy to me, Regan. I don't think you have anything to worry yeah. about. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're, you're fine. You're fine. I'm doing pretty good. But I would say, even though that human part of me now, we're a tad stater. Life is good. But from experiencing every all my clients, these hundreds that have had these past lives and how they feel when they're out of the body, like, this is so great. 
and me being there a couple of times and knowing that I just know when I leave this physical body and I'm looking down at it and I, I'm part of the bigger picture again, I'm going to be going, wow, cool. I can't wait to come back and do, or do I want to come back again? You know, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know, but I, because look at the way the world's going right now. So if I go yeah. to say in 10 years, I'm wondering what's in 30 or 40 or 50 years is, are we going to be around anymore? What's going to happen? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And, we think uh, about that for our daughter. Actually, it's uh, yeah. something we, we it's, it's very very much in our yeah. top of our mind. Now, unfortunately. if we do, I, I mean, you guys are cool. I I love the way you you do your show and everything like that too. I'd be happy to Thank come you. on. And, Thank you. I, we yeah. could do another show because I wanted to get into today, but we don't have time of the quantum healing uh, hypnosis, yes. uh, which is H what I've incorporated in mind and about mm -hmm. the physical healings that happen to sometimes to people mm -hmm. over there, mm -hmm. and and especially emotional healings that happen. And also about the other different stations, there's the, some people experience the station where they, they can actually go back and they can see when they chose their current life. Like you're looking down and you can, wow. it's so interesting what, you know, how they explain it, where you're seeing this process of how do you choose another life? There's a little, the library some people go to. Usually they'll sit them down in front of a book and, and a, a guide will get a book and you're paging it through and it has everything you've ever been since you were mm. born. And um, what if you don't read? A, yeah. <laughs> there are people out there that hate to read. <laughs> is it in English? <laughs> well, <laughs> is there, are there audio books? Can you even listen to the books? <laughs> in the pages that uh, my, my clients have described it as pages of light. And they know they're getting on some yeah. level. They're seeing everything, but their physical self can't really tell you exactly what that was. But they, they just say, I just know I'm seeing everything. And on some level, I'm getting that. There's a place yeah. of rejuvenation. Uh, where people go and sometimes they don't want, they don't want to go on to another part of heaven because they love it so much where they can feel their, their whole inner self and body being cleansed and cleaned. Oh my gosh, there's so many stories right. of that. That's really great. And so yeah, there's so, a lot, there's a lot there that we've discovered yeah. that you can't get over and talk about in an hour, you know? Yeah, <laughs> so, no, we're going to, we're going to have to get you back now. So just to, to summarize really quickly, because we are way out of time, but you actually bring people into a hypnotic state that allows them to transfer their consciousness to a time when they were in between lives and they yes. can actually go there and speak to and experience heaven, speak to anyone in heaven, speak to Jesus, hang out with good old Jay himself, hang out with your guardian angels or your spirits or whatever you believe. And you can stay there as long as you want. You can get whatever answers you want, whatever answers you want, and then come back and not have any kind of adverse reactions or anything like that. That sounds like heaven on earth. It to really me. is. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely true. Awesome. In my experience and so far. And the best thing about it is that anybody, within the sound of our voice right now, anybody could reach out to you and get that done right now. Now, right? this is not an exclusive thing that just kings and queens get an access to, <laughs> right. right? Any Joe Schmo like Will and Karen could actually get this done. And we've been, we tried, we tried hard to get it, to get it together. We mm -hmm. weren't able to, to connect it, but maybe for the next one, we'll be able to handle something like that. Yeah. But. Okay. Because I have a, a bit of a waiting list, but I, but it's not as bad as it went with Michael Newton. He had a four year waiting list when he was doing this. Oh well. my gosh. I now know, what that we have, have two, 250 of us as people go to newtoninstitute.org. And they can go, they can um, look for a therapist in the area of the 250 of us. And what I say to people, well, you know, like people, when they find me on there, they go, well, there was these three or four, but I just felt I saw your face or something. And I just knew you were the one. And it seems to work sure. out good that way. So if they can have a session, I'm happy to help them find someone in their area. If there's not anybody, we can do it online. I have one like other therapist now. She somehow, she's here. She's actually on the board now. And she's been just doing so many of these in India in the middle of the night or whenever she's up, whatever. It's oh, just wow. one person after another, another on, on, wow. on, and some therapists now are preferring just to do it on Zoom because it's just right. so much easier. Sure. I sure. love to do it in person the most, but on Zoom, you know, I did one in Philadelphia last week. It was really, really great. Connected with a, a, a really good person. We had a A plus session. Oh, so, nice. it, you know, people go, say, go by your, your guy. Hey, is mm -hmm. Regan sure. the right guy for me or do I need to find somebody else? You have a website Mike? called visittheafterlife.com, right? Yeah, there's two T's. Yeah, visittheafterlife.com. Great videos right. on there. You can see actually a young lady going through the process on there. And there's nice. uh, you see uh, Michael Newton's on there talking about before he passed right. away. He had some sure. things. So there's some really good information on there.
There's a link contact me on the contact page. There's a phone number in there. And I'm right. happy to help anybody who comes my way. That, excellent. We're going to yeah. add direct links in our show notes to your website and to the books that you mentioned. Everything, one-stop shop. In, when it comes to Regan Forston, just go to skepticmanofvision.com, go to his episode page, you'll see all the stuff there directly laid in for you, so it makes it super easy to contact you. Regan, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate your time and your sharing of this, this really cool modality yeah. with us that we literally have just scratched the surface on. So yeah, we're going we're gonna to reach out to you. We'll, we'll get you back on. we got a lot to talk about. Uh, you guys are yeah, yeah. You're good hosts. Oh, thank I, you. I would thank love you. to be on again sometime. We hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as we have. If you did and you feel called to give back, we invite you to visit our website at skepticmetaphysician.com where you can donate to the show or subscribe as a member through our Buy Me a Coffee campaign. Your support will go a long way towards allowing Karen and I to bring you these wonderful conversations and teachings in more and more robust ways. Well, that's all for now. We will see you on the next episode of The Skeptic Metaphysician. Until then, take care.